And we are moving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's great to be back with you. And it looks like everything's working today. We look forward to hearing from you through the chat uh, to confirm this. And we're so happy to have Deva Sobel with us today. Hi, Deva. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so great to see you, even though it's virtual. I've, I miss being in your place. <laughs> yeah. And I think we were last together about a year ago to see a play, right? We went to see a play about Marie yeah. Curie in a nice. theater. Yeah. yeah. And we sat next to each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There it was, were people you know, in the theater. There were a lot of people. about in the this that, you know, we were all crowded in subway, in buses, in theaters, and things. And now, how is it when it's going to be normal again? Are we going to be second thinking everything? Are we too yeah. close? Yeah. yeah. Well, we will probably think yeah. differently. We know more now. So Deva has been a part of my Galileo's Daughters since I think it was 2005. Oh no, it was earlier than that. Earlier? 2003? You know, I would have looked it up, Sarah. But. <laughs> uh, well, but our first concert memory. was 2001, and that was shortly after 9 11. And maybe it was the following year I got in touch with you. I, I remember yeah. that we went to see a talk you gave about the book Galileo's Daughter at the Museum of Natural History. And I think okay. uh, either we talked to you then or I don't know, it was just oh. before we met. Her. I It was a mutual friend knew you. Yeah. And I asked, they wrote to you and said, can this woman write to you? And you said, sure. And then I asked you if we could use some of the uh, translated letters that mm -hmm. Suar and uh, Celeste wrote to Galileo, her father. And you said, sure. And then you invited said, me to come read them at a concert exactly. you were doing in a That's church. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I then we made a show together about the interconnectedness of science and music. And right. we've been doing that show for a long time, at least 10 years or more. That's right. Yeah. So we just wanted to show a little clip from one of our performances that we did of Perpetual Motion with Davis Sobel. This heavenly machinery, like the gearwork of a great clock, turned day to night and back to day again. The ancients believed the cosmic order obeyed the same mathematical rules and proportions as the tones on a musical scale. Plato introduced the memorable phrase, music of the spheres, to describe the melodious perfection of the heavens. Plato spoke also of celestial harmony and the most magnificent choir, terms that imply the songs of angels, though they referred specifically to the unheard polyphony of the planets in their gyrations. Oh. 
And I forgot to mention that's animation and images by Mr. Mark Wagnon. Indeed. And Blender. He's the he's our fifth beetle, Deva. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's great. So we had some bad news recently about a very beloved and important uh, radio telescope. Radio telescope. Yeah. Radio telescope. Yeah. In Puerto Rico. And you have a very personal connection to Arecibo. I do. I do. Years ago, I was the science writer at Cornell, and I got to go there as part of my work and cover the whole story of the upgrading of the telescope, which went on in the early 1970s. And the um, end of that process entailed beaming a message into space, which I thought about when you had Ron McFarlane on recently, and we're talking about Fermi's paradox and communicating with alien intelligence. So that message was aimed at the great cluster in Hercules, only because it happened to be overhead at the hour of the ceremony. But that object is 25,000 light years away. So the message, the message will be en route for a very long time. Uh, yeah. So I, I love that place. I was there several times. And when I heard in the summer that one of the support cables had given way, I, I could just picture what big trouble that would be because the, the structure that hangs over the bowl weighs hundreds of tons. And I, I couldn't imagine how they could fix it. What, what sort of a repair job could be done on those cables? And even though I know nothing about structural engineering, apparently nobody could figure out how to fix it because they had decided to decommission the telescope and then it collapsed. Then there was this catastrophic breakage of, the, of another main cable and the whole thing went crashing into the bowl. End of an era. Yeah, I'm just showing a few of the pictures now. They look pretty, pretty small. Yeah, it's definitely an end of an era. Um, we, uh, we visited that Hmm? Once. We, we did. We were there. there. We just we figured out 1993. It was yes. We visited friends. That was just before they did the upgrade. I remember the, the dome wasn't there. I think it was in 95. They did the upgrade. Or... No, no, there, earlier. There, I think there was there were more various upgrades over the yeah. years, but the one I was most involved with happened much earlier. Oh, okay. In the early 70s, yeah. Only seven. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because they added this dome in it. That, that, that's kind of the latest. The Gregorian thing. dome. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So we'll miss it. And, you know, Frank Drake probably. Did, did Frank Drake make some work there too? Oh, yeah. He Frank was Drake, the yeah. on site director and then he was head of the National Astronomy and Ionosphere Center at Cornell, which was the oversight group of the telescope. So that was really how I met him was through working at Cornell and the, yeah. visiting, visiting Arecibo oh. as part of that job. And then you ended up writing a book together, correct? Yes, we did. Yeah. It's really uh, Frank's biography and why he believes that uh, the likelihood of extraterrestrial intelligence is great. Uh, their longevity is a question just as our longevity is a question that yeah. uh, while it's, it's likely that life develops on planets and intelligence evolves. And then, then you have to wonder how long do the intelligent creatures survive their own technology? And that is certainly a question for us these days. Uh, yep, definitely a question for us. We are yeah. faced 
there's uh, some kind of a deadline or some some, some inflection point. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and in a way, this this COVID is a bit of a taste of what mm. can happen. Yeah. You know, when global things happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, can we just yeah. talk about something a little more positive now, people? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about poetry now. Yeah. <laughs> well, Deva, you are the editor, poetry editor of Scientific American, which is really amazing. We enjoyed reading the poems every month. Oh, and, I'm so uh, glad. So tell us about that a little bit. And you have a couple poems to read for us, correct? Yes, I do. Yeah. I, I learned a little over a year ago that the magazine had routinely included poetry when it first started in 1845. So it's, it's the longest continuously published magazine in the United States. But the practice of including poetry died out very quickly after just the first few years. But when I learned that, I was so intrigued, especially because I've been interested in scientific poetry for about 40 years uh, since meeting Diane Ackerman at Cornell. So while I was there working as science writer in the news bureau, she was a graduate student in English and she had talked Carl Sagan into being on her committee. And she was writing a cycle of poems about the solar system, scientifically accurate poems. Uh, which she published. And then a few years later, she and I were hoping to work on an anthology of scientific poetry. And, um, and it never came to fruition. But I, I just decided to write to the editors of the magazine and, and suggest that they reinstate poetry and that I would be would be more than happy to, to do that work if they were interested. And the timing was just right. You know, it was, they were about to have their 175th anniversary year and a new feature seemed really a good idea. And it all came together very quickly. And I am having the most fun doing this. <laughs> It's, um, but it, my original idea was to use some of the scientific poetry I had collected over the 40 years, but they felt, no, no, it should all be new work specifically commissioned for, for this column. So that was a little harder to pull together. Um, and I appealed to Diane to write the first poem, which she did. And the poem I'm going to read you is uh, one of her poems, but it's, it's not the one that appeared in the magazine. It's the one that makes reference to the Arecibo telescope and to the issue of extraterrestrial intelligence altogether. It's called, We Are Listening. As our metal eyes wake to absolute night, where whispers fly from the beginning of time, we cup our ears to the heavens we are listening. On the volcanic rim of Flagstaff and in the fields beyond Boston, in a great array that blooms like coral from the desert floor, on high wire webs patrolled by computer spiders in Puerto Rico, we are listening for a sound beyond us, beyond sound, searching for a lighthouse in the breakwaters of our uncertainty, an electronic murmur, a bright, fragile, I am. Small as tree frogs staking out one end of an endless swamp, we are listening through the longest night we imagine, which dawns between the life and times of stars. Our voice trembles with its own electric, we who mood like iguanas, we who breathe sleep for a third of our lives, we who heat food to the steaminess of fresh prey, then feast with such good manners it grows cold. In mind gardens, 
and on real verandas, we are listening, wrapped among the Persian lilacs and the crickets, while radio telescopes roll their heads as if in anguish. With our scurrying minds and our lidless will and our lank floppy bodies and our galloping yens and our deep cosmic loneliness and our starboard hearts where love careens, we are listening, the small bipeds with the giant dreams. You're, you're waving a lot. Are we frozen? Uh, yeah, we are. <laughs> you're Sorry. not. You're not. Let's, let's distract the, po the poetry reading. <laughs> no, but you're fine. It's just an okay. issue with the YouTube. So sorry, everybody. We're I considered uh, stopping reading and then I decided to no, just no, no, go. No, 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 you're absolutely fine. Uh, Apparently we're, we're okay now, no? Are we okay now? Yeah, we are okay I now. Think so, it's funny. I, it I now. It's, yeah. it's really a uh, mind of its own, you know, it's like, yeah, uh, but it doesn't happen for the guests. So that's the important thing. It happens thing. just for us. Okay. Okay. And you have, you have a second poem you'd like to read? Um, yeah. So the column publishes one poem per month. And we've had all sorts of wonderful people this first year, including the National Poet Laureate of the UK, oh, Simon right. Armitage. So um, I'm going to read you his poem, which ran in the September issue, and it's called Ark. They sent out a dove. It wobbled home, wings slicked in a rainbow of oil, a sprig of tinsel snagged in its beak a yard of fishing line binding its feet. Bring back, bring back the leaf. They sent out an Arctic fox. It plodded the bays of the Northern fringe in muddy socks and a nylon cape. Bring back, bring back the leaf. Bring back the reed and the reef. Set the ice sheet back on its frozen plinth tuck the restless water course into its bed, set the glacier down on its highland throne, put the snow cap back on the mountain peak. Let the Northern lights be the Northern lights, not the alien glow over Glasgow or Leeds. A camel capsized in a tropical flood, caimans dozed in Antarctic lakes, polymers rolled in the sturgeon's blood. Hippos wandered the housing estates. Bring back, bring back the leaf. Bring back the tusk and the horn unshorn. Bring back the fern, the fish, the frond and the fowl, the golden toad and the pygmy owl. Revisit the scene where swallowtails fly through acres of unexhausted sky. They sent out a boat. Go, little breaker. Splinter the pack ice and flows. Nose through the rafts and pads of wrappers and bottles and nurdles and cans. The bergs and atolls and islands and states of plastic bags and microbeads and the forests of smoke. Bring back, bring back the leaf. Bring back the river and sea. Mm. Oh. I feel like I've heard that or read it. Was it? You in... read it in the magazine because okay. it was in the temper. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. And that poem was written for the naming of an Arctic research vessel, the Sir David Attenborough. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, he's been in the news lately because he's been, uh, well, re advocating again about the, ne the need to be aware of climate change and to do things. Uh, How many times do we Jane have Goodall. to say that? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's pretty alarming. <laughs> and we're all just going about our day. And, you know, of course, we don't want to think about it 24 seven or else it's really horrifying. But we need action. We need action now. And yeah. I'm hoping 2021 will bring that action. Uh, very quickly, because there's a lot of people 
who are imperiled, yeah. will, will be imperiled and already are because of the, the effects I think of that, climate change. Uh, so. People that are in their twenties and thirties now because are becoming very aware of this more than yeah. I mean. Oh it, yeah. In a way, I, me, I've been aware ever since when I was in my twenties, but now it seems you know it it it, it, it just taken more of a effect on people because the effect effect of being felt. Yes, it's dire. Yeah. Um, well, let's pull back from the earth yeah. and <laughs> let's talk about that conjunction that's happening tomorrow. Ooh, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of a neat thing. It doesn't, I, I'm surprised sometimes by the, the things that get picked up and fussed over because this is not a spectacular event. You know, a, a good sunset it was much more dramatic and exciting looking than this event. And yet it's significant. It's like, just, just like the transits of Venus not too long ago yeah. Yeah. were not really gorgeous things to behold, but it was thrilling to see them because they happen so rarely. Uh, and a, a great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter is not really rare, but it's rare that the planets come this close, the way they will be uh, this year. And that it's happening at a time of day when we can actually see it. You know, if it happens in the daytime, we don't yeah. see it. Understood. But here right. it is just right, right at uh, sunset and they're low on the horizon. So soon they will, they will not be visible even though they'll still be very close for, for quite a while but we won't be seeing them anymore. So, Sarah, Mark, can you do anything about the weather? Yeah. <laughs> um, We've been working about I sang at church it. today yes, and I said uh, a little prayer. <laughs> okay, good. Good, uh, because yeah. we need something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mark, you but thought I, there I, might be an opening. To see them, it's fun to see them get closer and closer and just watch the positions change. And this, in, in the times mm. when astrology was given great credit, a great conjunction usually signified something very important, maybe maybe a war, maybe a plague, you know, kind of like we're having now. Yeah, it's like the yeah. end of the Trump era. Uh-huh. <laughs> we hope it's the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for it to really yes. be the end. Um, we are waiting. Uh, yeah, we definitely are having a play. I put up some yeah. pictures of the conjunction and uh, put up, uh, yeah, uh, what is what a view, the, a close-up view would be. Um, if you had, let me go to the next one. Let's see. Again. Here we go. So this is uh, what you would see if you look in binoculars, and. Uh, you know, it's very, cool. very rare. And, it, yeah. it, you know, it's binoculars. It's pretty powerful binoculars, actually. I mean, like my telescope, I would see something about like that with, you know, pretty good magnification. But it's very rare that you can see that in one eyepiece. You, you Usually it's like Jupiter is here and then Saturn's over there. Oh, there cause it's just easier. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. It, <laughs> it, I, would, I don't want to... I, I hate that... Uh, that thing is like killing a, uh, two birds with one stone, but it's bad, bad analogy, but <laughs> it is, it is more efficient. Right? Oh, killing two birds with one stone. Yeah, we one don't want to kill eyes. any birds. That's pretty good. That could be our new expression. Two planets and one eyepiece. Yeah. yeah. There we go. We needed the writer. That's what happened. <laughs> Perfect. I'd much rather say that than the other. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. going to be the new uh being productive meme yeah yeah two planets in one, one eyepiece or wait two two, two two planets in one eyepiece in one yeah. eyepiece yes yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's great so deva you said you had one more poem for us that's well yeah i might I'm, we might not have time to read another poem but um uh, got a few minutes a whole book of poems uh written by 
Donna Kane, who uh, I've not yet had in the column, but her, her book is called Orrery. And the poems are almost all about Pioneer 10. And if you remember, the pioneers were the spacecraft that carried the plaque showing the man and woman. Yes. Of the space, and the man and woman are naked. And so uh, I was working at Cornell in that era, and there was so much flack about the plaque, <laughs> plaque, plaque. <laughs> and um, because they were uh, naked? Yeah, you know, this was a long time ago. But now, so in the new take, in the poem, what the, the criticism is that the man is anatomically correct, but the woman is not. And so her poem is about, um, about that fact. And in fact, the, the title of it is Depiction of a Man and a Woman on the Pioneer 10 space probe plaque. So in this era of COVID, when writers cannot have normal book events, things are being done on Zoom. And uh, Donna asked me if I would read that poem and make a little video that she could show as part of her book launch. So I read the early version of it that I had. I didn't read it out of the new book. And so it was a little bit, it was a stretch for me because in the poem, she used every slang term for the female genitalia that I had ever heard. And I'd <laughs> never said most of those words aloud, but I figured, you know, it's art, I'm gonna go for it. So I recorded my video and sent it to her. And she was absolutely mortified. She said, oh, Davis Sobel say the C word. <laughs> and, and in the book, those words have been expunged. <laughs> but, she with, but she went with my video anyway. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> well, that says a lot about your delivery. Yeah, my delivery <laughs> was very heartfelt. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, awesome. All right. Did you want to read so, it to us now? Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll read it. Yeah. If we, if we still have time, but I'll read you the, sure. the cleaned up version. Oh, okay. And, and okay. The reason she cleaned it up was that she was too embarrassed to read it aloud at her poetry reading. So, okay. If a representation of a man with a penis and a woman without a vagina is hurtling at 20 clicks a second away from Earth and makes contact with an alien who thinks just as we do, so admires the woman's hairdo, but gets the method of procreation wrong, well, it won't be by accident, will it? The man, I must say, is anatomically lovely, and I like how his raised hand illustrates the opposable thumb while doubling as a sign of goodwill. But would it have killed us to add a short line for her cleft, to make her an artifact, not space junk, mound of Venus with a Brazilian wax job instead of Barbie made by Mattel? They say Greek statuary omits it, but come on. We talk about being safe, then spend our days splitting the atom. In the time it takes me to write Snatch, the impressions are further 300 miles away. The chances of correction are nil. When the earth's fried to a crisp, the plaque will carry on, ambassador of the easily offended, the quickly aroused. It hopes you will understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's fantastic. We have to get that book. Yeah. I was wondering, which one little question before we say goodbye. How do you organize your library? To find books when you're looking for research or whatever. Oh, well, I, I have, I'm in my office right now. I have an entire wall of books about Galileo. Um, they're by, by theme. So all my poetry books are, are all together. And these days it's possible to do a lot more research online than used yes. to be possible. And libraries are being very cooperative, far away libraries getting things yeah. and making 
photocopies and making research, research materials available online. Well, and I'm amazed at how many books have been digitized that you can actually go and read a book page by page on websites such as the Internet Archive. It, it's just, it's remarkable. Yeah. And my, my all time favorite library, the, the Linda Hall Library of Science, Technology and Engineering, that is, that is just a, a treasure house, that place. Mm -hmm. And yes. they have a lot of fully digitized books, rare books. I have about eight books of music checked out from the New York Public Library from March, and they've just let me renew it over and over again. Yeah. Everyone they who... don't even want them back. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll probably spray everything when it comes back. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for chatting with us. Well. I love being with you guys. You know that we have to plan another adventure. Definitely. Yeah. Like, yes. Well, we weren't able to go to Argentina for the eclipse. So maybe the next one that's going to be in the United States, everything well, will be. There's one before, no, there's some other one before, but it's definitely the, the easiest one is the 2020. Yeah, 24. Pretty Four. sure it's 2024. 2024. Oh, yeah, 24. Yeah. You, I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, how many eclipses have you observed? I, I think nine. Yeah. She's serious. Yeah. She's very serious. <laughs> yeah. for, for a while, it was a real addiction. And I could afford it. You know, I've run out of money now. So I, I'm not looking to make any any big trips. Okay, well, somewhere in the States. We can somewhere do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Road trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deva. Thank you. And Bye, Sarah. Yay. And we will be back on Tuesday with Carol Scudder and Peter Danielovich. Tomorrow we're taking a break because we're hoping to observe that conjunction. Call All us right. optimists. What? Call us optimists. Yeah, I am. I'm a cockeyed okay. optimist. <laughs> but that's why you guys love me, right? Yeah.